Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part two of the section of the book titled Products and Quotients of Vector Spaces. In this video, we will be focusing on quotients. We begin by defining the sum of a vector and a subspace. Suppose V is a vector in our vector space V and U is a subspace of V. Then we define our vector plus the subspace to be the subset of V defined by adding every element of the subspace to the vector. Let's look at an example. Our vector space will be R2, and suppose U is a subspace consisting of all vectors of the form x, 2x, as x ranges over the real numbers. Thus U is the line in R2 through the origin with slope 2. It's the leftmost line shown in the picture here. The point 10, 20 is on this line. Now let's take our point 17, 20 and look at 17, 20 plus u. That's the line in R2 that contains the point 17, 20 and has slope 2. The reason it contains the point 17, 20 is that u contains the point 0, 0, and when I add those two vectors, I get the point 17, 20. Note that the subset 1720 plus u is parallel to the original subspace u. An affine subset of our vector space v is defined to be a subset of v of the form a vector plus some subspace of v. We now define the notion of parallel based upon our last example. If we have a vector in v and a subspace, then the affine subset consisting of the sum of that vector and subspace is said to be parallel to the original subspace. Let's look at an example. Our vector space will be R2, and our subspace will be the last one we considered, the subspace of all vectors of the form x, 2x. Then all lines in R2 with slope 2 are parallel to u. You can see in the picture from the last example, we have u being the line through the origin with slope 2, and there's one of the lines parallel to it. But any line parallel to that line would be an affine subset of R2 that's parallel to U. As another example, let's take our vector space now to be R3, and our subspace U to be the set of elements of R3 whose third coordinate is 0. That's often called just the xy plane. Then the affine subsets of R3 parallel to U are all the planes in R3 that are parallel to the xy plane in the usual sense. Be sure you think about that and understand why that fits with our definition. Now we are ready to define quotient spaces. Suppose u is a subspace of our vector space v. Then the quotient space, v divided by u, is a set of all affine subsets of v parallel to u. Let's look at some examples. For our first example, we will work in R2, and u being the line through the origin with slope 2. Then R2 divided by u is a set of all lines in R2 that have slope 2. For our second example, we'll work in the vector space R3, and now u will be a line in R3 containing the origin. That makes it a subspace of R3. R3 divided by u is then the set of all lines in R3 parallel to that line. For our last example, we will again work in R3. Let u be a plane in R3 containing the origin. Thus u is a subspace of R3. R3 divided by u is a set of all planes in R3 that are parallel to our plane u. The result displayed here is important in terms of understanding how affine subsets interact. Look at the equivalence of conditions B and C. That equivalence says that two affine subspaces that are parallel to each other, in other words, both determined by a subspace U, are either equal or disjoint. And that fits with our intuition if we consider, for example, the case where U is a line in R2 through the origin we see that two lines parallel to that line are either the same or they do not intersect. 
This result is not difficult, but be sure that you thoroughly understand it. Read the details in the book. Suppose u is a subspace of v. We have defined the quotient space v divided by u. We now define addition and scalar multiplication on this quotient space in the obvious way as shown here. You should make sure you understand why these definitions make sense. Now that we have defined an addition and scalar multiplication on the quotient space, it should be no surprise to you that the quotient space becomes a vector space under those operations. Again, be sure to verify the details. Now we define the quotient map, which traditionally is called pi. Suppose u is a subspace of our vector space v. The quotient map pi is the linear map from v to the quotient space v divided by u defined by pi of a vector v is equal to v plus u. Our definition of addition and scalar multiplication on the quotient space v divided by u ensures that this map pi is indeed a linear map. Now we can find the dimension of a quotient space using this map pi. Suppose v is finite dimensional and u is a subspace of v. Then the dimension of the quotient v divided by u is equal to the dimension of v minus the dimension of u. Here's the proof of this result. The fundamental theorem of linear maps as applied to pi tells us that the dimension of v is equal to the dimension of the null space of pi plus the dimension of the range of pi. The null space of pi is precisely the subspace u. And the range of pi is the entire quotient space, v divided by u. Thus we get the second line shown here. Now simply solve this equation for the dimension of v divided by u, getting the result that the dimension of v divided by u equals the dimension of v minus the dimension of u. Our final concept in this video is the concept of the induced map on a quotient. Suppose t is a linear map from v to w. We define the induced map denoted t tilde it maps from v divided by the null space of t into w, and it's defined as you can see here. This induced map t tilde is occasionally useful because of the following proposition. Suppose t is a linear map from v to w. Then t tilde is a linear map from the quotient space v divided by the null space of t to w. That's quite easy to verify. Part B of this result says that the induced map t tilde is injective. That's an important, useful result. The way to think about it is that what a quotient space does is it identifies everything in the subspace we're dividing by to zero. In this case, we're identifying everything in the null space of t to zero, and thus t tilde has as its null space just zero, which means the t tilde is injective. Part C of this result says that the range of t tilde equals the range of t. That's quite easy to see. Part D says that v divided by the null space of t is isomorphic to the range of t. That's true because t tilde is both injective and surjective. Thus, we have an isomorphism. This concludes part two of the video on products and quotients of vector spaces.